Good morning. Got some good news. First off, Jesus is still risen and Jesus is in control. So that's great news, right? I've also got some another, so another point of good news, okay? So the governor has put out an executive order to allow public gatherings in parking lots. So next Sunday, May 24th, we are going to have a parking lot church service directly in our back parking lot, okay? 10 o'clock. Um, it's going to be kind of like the old drive-in movies, and we're going to have worship. I'm going to preach using a microphone and speakers, and here are the parameters that the governor has set out. First off, people need to be in their cars, and they can have the windows down, but the cars need to be about six feet apart from each other. And uh, I mean, if you want to bring your own snacks like the drive-in movies, great, go for it. Um, we are also still planning on pre-recording the message for those who feel like they need, still want to remain under quarantine. But I do want as many people as possible, if you feel comfortable, to come out next Sunday at 10, 10 a.m. And uh, here's the thing. It's going to be great to see everyone, even though it's going to be on a limited basis. Here's what it does. It gives people hope because as, I, as I'm more and more, I'm just seeing that more and more people are becoming discouraged. And so just coming out on a, on a Sunday, even if it's in the parking lot, um, I think it's going to do a lot for us. Okay, so be part of what I believe God is doing, incremental steps on getting us back to being able to come together in whatever the new normal is going to be. So if you could arrive at 950, okay, so that we can, um, we can put everybody in, I am going to need some help. So I'm going to need some traffic ushers, some traffic directors. We're going to mark it out where people can park, where they can't park. I'm going to need help setting up the tent, and I'm going to need help setting up the uh, sound system. So there you go. Excited about it. With that, would you turn with me to Mark chapter 4? So turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Title of today's message is, Soil selection. Soil selection. Now, in my house, I've got four different types of soil in our driveway. It's the hardened soil. Number one, hardened soil. Driveway, the day after day, the cars just drive over the same paths and where the tires are, are driving over, nothing grows. Why? Because it's hardened. It's a pathway. It's hardened soil. Number two type of soil is the shallow soil. When we first bought our house, I knew that it was a fixer-upper. However, I didn't know just how many things were hidden even in the backyard. So I'm working in the backyard and I notice that there's, some, there's something underneath the surface. And I started digging various places and I started to find large chunks of asphalt, about a foot by a foot big, you know, it's a square foot. And I'm thinking, what in the world is this? It's probably they just used fill dirt and they just kind of, kind of tried to level it. And however, here's what happened is that there was a thin uh, layer of soil just on top. And so it had rocky soil. It was the, the soil was just shallow and not a lot of things grew over that. Number three type of soil at my house, crowded soil. Also, when we bought our house, in the backyard, get this, there was a cast iron bathtub buried in the backyard. At this point, you're probably hearing banjos playing. You're probably thinking, Mark, was there a, uh, you know, some sort of couch up front? Was there a broken down washing machine out front? No, there wasn't. However, there was a cast iron bathtub buried in our backyard. So after I dug out the, the dirt that was inside the tub, I got a sledgehammer and I, I broke up the tub and I filled the, um, the big hole that was left over with good soil and I planted good seed. And for a while, there was good grass. However, unfortunately, the weeds took over. Crowded soil. Number four, fruitful soil. Fruitful soil. A few years ago, we built a raised garden and we brought in good soil. We had it, it shipped in, trucked in, 
from one of the local garden centers and we planted a garden. And over the years, we've had various uh, vegetables and flowers as well. You guys know where I'm going with this, don't you? The type of soil determines the type of growth. The type of soil determines the type of growth. Jesus tells us one of his most famous parables, and it's the parable of the soils. He equates the four soils to four different heart conditions. So I want to, you to ask yourself, what type of heart do I have? Also, do I want spiritual fruit produced from my life? And so with that, let's pray. Lord, we do thank you. Lord, once again, thank you that you are still on the throne. Lord, we thank you that you are alive. You are still risen from the dead. And Lord, we ask you, God, that you would be speaking to each one of our hearts, even right now, to where we can receive the word of God with good hearts to apply these things to our lives, that each one of us might produce fruit in our life, 30, 60, and 100 fold. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 4 starting in verse 1, says, And again, he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on the stony ground, where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground, and yielded um, a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus, now starting to teach in parables, uses a very familiar picture. He uses an agricultural explanation. And of course, we know that that society back then, it was primarily an agricultural society. Even those who were in different types of trades, fishermen and carpenters, they would often have some sort of garden or some sort of plot of land where they would also grow various vegetables. And he explains there's four different types of soil. The hard soil, there's, it's on the path. The birds come and they steal the seeds away. Then there's the shallow soil. And as, as I've said before, in Israel, there is a lot of rocks. There are a lot of rocks. And so people would understand that saying, yeah, I know it. When I've got rocky soil, the, the seeds can't go down very, very deep. And when the sun comes up, they wither away. And then, of course, there's the crowded soil, the thorns. And those thorns or the weeds choke up the good plants, the good growth. And then, of course, there's the good soil, which is very productive. And he starts to explain these things. Now, we continue on in verse 10. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. It goes on in verse 13, it says, And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? So, Jesus initially teaches about four different types of soils. And then apparently he dismissed the crowd and everybody was kind of left hanging on the edge of their seats. And notice what it says. It says those who are with him and the 12. 
So it wasn't just the 12 apostles. It was other people who were saying, wait a second, Jesus, you just shared this thing. What does this mean? And he says, I'm teaching now in parables. And only those who have a true desire for God will seek to know the word of God and the meaning of it and how to apply it to their lives. It was kind of like a test. Jesus was giving them just enough to see if they would come back and they would say, what does this mean? I want to, I want to know. It wasn't just one of those people who just go to church and, and they hear the message and say, yeah, that was a nice message. And then they go home and forget about it. These people were, they had a hunger for the word of God. They had a hunger for the things of God. And as a result, for those who really wanted to know, Jesus, Jesus says, okay, I'm going to explain it now. He was more than happy to help apply these things to their lives. Let me ask you this, when you read the Bible or when you um, listen to a Bible study, do you seek the Lord and say, Lord, how does this apply to me personally? What, what are the things that you want to do in my life, in the soil of the heart of my life? And if you do, Jesus is saying, of course, I'm gonna help you to cultivate the word of God that goes into your heart. And in verse 13, he tells us, I'm going to give you the key to all the, the, uh, the parables. It was kind of like one of those secret decoder rings. You know, it, it had all the mysteries it had. Okay, this, this lines up with that. Okay, this is what it means. And we're going to see here a couple things. First off, we're going to see that the seed is the word of God. The seed that is sown is the word of God. We're going to see that the birds are representative of the devil or something evil. And then we also know that the soil is the condition of various types of hearts. Okay, so first off, he explains the hardened heart, the hardened heart. Mark chapter 4, verse 14 says, The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So he says, the hardened heart, the seeds that fall along a hardened pathway. Now, in reading the Gospels, it's always very helpful to look to see in the other Gospels if the other Gospel writers will add in something else that Jesus brought in. In fact, Matthew 13 and Luke 8 do tell us that, do record this same parable. And there's something very significant in Luke's Gospel that it's really going to open up our eyes to the meaning of each one of the types of these soils. In Luke chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus explains, he says, those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Do you guys get the last few words? Lest they should believe and be saved. You see, the heart, according to Jesus in Luke's gospel, chapter 8, the heart that is hardened, they are not saved. The devil comes and takes it away. However, those words are not applied to any of the other three types of soils. So therefore we can um, rightfully assume that Jesus says, the hardened heart, they are not saved, but the other three types of soils are saved. And, but they all have different characteristics and different, different levels of fruit coming from their lives. It's very important to know this. All right. So the hardened soil, it's the path. These people, they are hardened by the continual rejection of the Holy Spirit that they need Jesus. And the devil comes and tempts them away and says, you don't really need that. They hear the gospel. They reject it. And the devil comes and wants to lure them away. The devil is always going to distort and deny the word of God. The devil is always going to distort 
and deny the word of God. In fact, right at the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, so he's talking to Eve in the Garden of Eden, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So right there in the Garden of Eden, the devil is distorting and he's denying the word of God. The devil will always say, did God really say? Did God really say that he created the world literally? Did God really say that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Did God really say that that is a sin? Well, everybody else is doing it. God didn't really say that. It's acceptable socially now, culturally. The whole world is involved in that. It's okay. There don't seem to be any bad, necessarily bad immediate consequences. Did God really say that? Remember, Satan is always wanting to distort and deny the word of God. Remember, Peter's there. And Jesus was probably on Peter's boat, using it as some sort of a platform. And later Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And so he's saying, the word of God is the seed, and we're born again by the living word of God, which abides forever. It's not a problem with the preacher. You see, Jesus being the greatest preacher, it's not about the problem with the preacher. It's the attitude of a hardened heart. All right. These people are saved, but have shallow faith. Sometimes we get led by our emotions and our experiences. And sometimes we can go to like a great Christian concert or a great time of, of worship or go <coughs> have a great um, spiritual retreat, a spiritual mountaintop, or go on a short-term missions trip and you see God doing a lot of great things and then you come back home. Or even, I remember when I went to Bible college. It's a Christian bubble. It, we called it Christian Disneyland. Everything was great there. And even the problems, you had a ton of people around you and you're always in the Word and there was some great worship and all these wonderful things. But what happens? Sometimes when we come back down from our spiritual mountaintops, our, our emotional, our, and, and these, there's nothing wrong with having a good emotional, spiritual time, but sometimes when we come down, real life happens. There's difficulties, unmet expectations, trials, and spiritual attack happen. And sometimes we can say, well, I thought things would be better. I just had this great retreat with the men's group or with the ladies group. And yeah, I was going to go for it. And now waiting for me back in real life, difficulty. And sometimes people fall away. Sometimes people even backslide. Sometimes people give up and they say, well, I'm not going to go to church anymore. All of us at various times in our lives can have shallow faith. All of us. Elijah, John the Baptist, even Paul the Apostle. Three spiritual giants. These guys are major league believers all had lapses of faith. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is what Paul writes. And Paul's writing in the first person. He says, we, not they, but we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead and delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will stand, still deliver us, you also helping together in prayer for us. This is Paul the Apostle. We despaired even of life. And he says, so that I don't trust in my life circumstances, but our trust is in the Lord. Our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in his promises that he is 
going to work all things together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. God promises that. And then he tells us something else. He tells us, you also helping together in prayer for us. You see, the Corinthians, they were praying for Paul as well. You see, Paul admitted it. He didn't say, well, I'm Paul the Apostle, and I don't struggle with anything. Now, the rest of you guys do, and you guys are down here, but I'm up here. No, he says, we despaired even of life. That's humility. You see, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And pride, when we put on the fake, the facade of, oh, I've got it all together, that can keep us from seeking prayer. Because it tells us here that the prayers of the Corinthians encouraged them. Now, if you're going through a difficult time and you'd come up to somebody and you ask for prayer, and if somebody comes and asks you for prayer, you don't have to preach at them. You don't have to say, give them some sort of Christian pat answer. You say, okay, let me pray for you. And as you pray, God is going to do some great things. He's going to bring some encouragement. See, God wants to meet you in the cave of Elijah and in the prison of John the Baptist. Don't give up. Get up. Don't focus on what you can't do. Don't focus on the prison. Don't focus on the situation. Focus on what God might want to do in a different way. Remember Joseph? He was in a prison. He was in lockdown too. And he was faithful to do the best job that he could in prison. And he became the administrator of the prison. See, God had something better for him in the future. God says, I'm going to give you this trial right now. And how you use this trial, how you accept it, embrace it, I want to use for something in the future. And of course, we remember that Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt. Not only did he help his country, but he even helped his own family. Don't focus on what you can't do. Don't focus on the prison. Don't focus on the situation. Don't focus on what they're doing over there or what, what's going on over here. Focus on the Lord and say, okay, Lord, how do you want me to act. What do you want me to do? How can I be faithful to you in this lockdown that I'm in? Paul, when he was in prison, under lockdown, under quarantine, what happened with him? He shared the gospel to his fellow prisoners, to the prison guards, to the various officials, and people were getting saved. He also wrote some letters. You might have heard of them. He wrote from prison, Ephesians and Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and Titus. Think about that. Without him being in prison, he may not have stopped long enough to write those letters of which we are benefiting even today. With this coronavirus, depression is skyrocketing. God's wanting to take us deeper. He wants to show us his love in a deeper way. He wants to show us his plans, his comfort, his ways. I read an online article from Forbes magazine. It says 36% of Americans admit to suffering severe depression because of the coronavirus. Social isolation, huge, absolutely astounding how much now we realize we need to be with other people. That's why what we're going to do is we're going to meet out in the back of the church parking lot because it's not perfect, but it's the best we can do. Social isolation is a major, major cause of depression. Understandably loss of loved ones, depression, discouragement, despair, and then fear, fear of what's going to happen. That can lead to discouragement and depression. Loss of income, many people suffering. Loss of income, loss of jobs, 
Maybe they've been laid off or maybe they're, they've even lost their business completely. There's no coming back from it. Understandable. Overall, there's just a loss of hope. And they estimate that the numbers are much higher. People just don't want to admit to it. But you know what? It's okay. It's okay to admit that you're hurting. And if you need prayer, you give me a call and I'll be happy to pray with you. Just listen to you. And you know what? Or you can call somebody else. It doesn't matter. Get some prayer. Don't let your pride get in the way. That's the shallow faith. And all of us, we can have times of that in our lives. Let's look at the crowded heart. Verse 18. Now, these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of, the, of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. There's no rocks in this soil. Apparently, the roots can go down deep. It's good soil. There's potential for fruits, but it's crowded and it's being choked up by the thorns. Where have we seen thorns in the Bible? Well, various places, but two, two places in specific come to mind. First off, in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, one of the curses on the ground was that thorns would grow up. We also remember on the cross, they placed, they just didn't lightly place on it. They, they slammed a crown of thorns on Jesus deep into his head. You see, Jesus bore the, the thorns. Thorns in the Bible are a picture of sin. He bore our sin. And this is what happened. These people are saved, but sin has entered into their lives. They've allowed sin. They've actively sinned. And it tells us, Jesus says, the cares of this world. You see, so many times we can be so caught up in life of this world, the here and the now, that we get choked spiritually. Be careful of worldly influences. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Be careful of non-Christian friends, friendships and even Christian friendships. Here's what I mean. Be careful of who you allow to influence your life. Because oftentimes... What happens is that if we've got some sort of negative influence in our lives, what's that going to do? It's going to corrupt us. Now, we're not to isolate ourselves from non-Christians. We are to actually have Christian friendships. Why? Because we've got an agenda. We've got God's agenda. The main and only reason we want to be friends with other non-Christians is because we love them. Why? We love them enough to be able to tell them about Jesus. We love them enough so that they won't go to hell. You see, friendship is love, isn't it? And telling people about Jesus is the most loving thing that we can do. Also be careful of what company we keep on TV and our phones and the internet. Because whatever Hollywood shares or whatever that YouTuber shares those things can start to become part of our minds and they can influence us, right? Bad company corrupts good morals. It also tells us, Jesus is, he says, the deceitfulness of riches. It's, if only I had enough money, then I would be happy. First Timothy chapter 6 tells us, but those who desire to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It doesn't say a rich person is in sin. No, it says the desire to be rich. So you, a person can be rich or a person can be poor, but if their main desire in life is those riches, the Bible says it's temptation. It's a snare. It's a trap designed to destroy our spiritual lives. The Bible says that desire for riches is foolish. 
It's harmful. It doesn't say that money is bad in and of itself. It says the love of money is the root of all sorts of good things. No, all sorts of evil, all kinds of evil. And it says it's going to bring many sorrows. Now we can say, well, that's somebody else. No, it's the same question. Did God really say that the love of money will bring many sorrows? Yeah, he did. We just read it right here. Jesus also warns us about the desire for other things, idolatry. It can be anything else that gets in the way of God or God's way or contradicts God's word. Luke's gospel tells us that this type of soil brings no fruit to maturity. About a month ago, we're all planting plants, right? We're doing our house projects where we're just going to go for it. Okay, we're under quarantine. Well, let's do some things around the house. Well, I was at Walmart one day and I, and I was by the garden center and I saw these little packets of seeds, 20 cents. And I'm like, hey, we're going to plant some flowers. Because usually we go to the garden store and we buy mature flowers. I said, hey, might as well buy some, plant some flowers. So we, we got a, an egg carton and filled it, the little compartments where the eggs go with soil. And then we planted the seed and we watered it and we put it by the window inside. And over the next few days, we saw little seed plants grow up. They were baby flower plants. And so they grew to a couple inches and I said, hey, I'm going to go plant these outside. So outside our front door, we've got these two flower pots, planted them in there. We're going to have flowers. It's going to be awesome. Well, what happens? Next day, I walk outside the front door. Notice there's all sorts of soil on the, on the front porch. And then I look into my flower pots. There's no baby flower plants. Some squirrel had eaten up our seedlings, our little plants. You see, our little plants never matured to, to bring forth flowers. And that's exactly what happens when we allow sin into our lives. We don't produce fruit to maturity. What's the cure to the weeds, the thorns, the sins in our lives? Well, Galatians chapter 6 tells us, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. What are we sowing to? The things of the flesh? The things of sin? Or are we sowing to the things of the Spirit? The things of God? Now let's talk about the fruitful life. The good soil. Verse 20. But these are the ones sown on the good ground, those who hear the word, accept it and bear fruit, some 30 fold, some 60, and some 100. It says that the, the good hearted soil, the good heart, hears the word and doesn't forget about it. The good heart hears the word, accepts it, applies it, meditates on it, lets the word become part of their lives. That's why I'm always, when I read the Bible, this is just me and Jesus this morning. I always write things down and I try to look at this little card all, you know, throughout the day so that I am meditating on the word. So hopefully what I read this morning, I don't forget about it because I'm busy about doing things and, and I'm doing things for the Lord, right? But I'm reading it, meditating, hoping, Lord, okay, Put this into my life, into my heart, because I want to be fruitful. I want to receive the word of God. What's the key to bearing good fruit? Well, it's staying close to Jesus. Remember that verse, 1 Corinthians, bad company corrupts good morals. Well, Jesus' company produces a fruitful life. The more that we are in the company and the presence of Jesus, it's going to produce life. Good life, good fruit in our lives. John chapter 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So as long as we are connected to Jesus, he will produce the fruit in our lives. And what's fruit? Fruit is Christian character and Christian service. Christian character found in Galatians chapter 5 But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, 
peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The closer we are to Jesus, the more that we're going to love God and love other people. The closer that we are to Jesus, the more joy we are going to exhibit and the more peace. And, and you know what? In this world, we need peace, don't we? We need patience, patience with others, kindness towards others, not snappiness. And it's easy to start snapping, right? Because when we're under stress, we can start snapping at people. Faithfulness. Okay, God, I don't understand it, but you've been faithful to me. I'm going to be faithful to you. Gentleness and self-control. Self-control saying no to sin. The closer we are to Jesus, the more that the Holy Spirit's going to produce this fruit in our lives. And you would also, the Holy Spirit's going to tell us, He's going to tell us, hey, you've been created as a new creation in Christ for good works. In other words, Christian service. What are your spiritual gifts? A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the spiritual giftings and your spiritual and specific calling in life. And are you using what God has given you for his glory, for his kingdom? When we as Christians were walking by faith, walking in the spirit closely with Jesus, not gratifying our sinful, lustful nature. God, he promises, he promised us to produce 30, 60, and 100 fold fruit in our lives. And you know what? The amount of fruit that comes from our lives depends on how closely we are walking to Jesus and how much we allow his word to absorb into our lives. Tony Evans, pastor in, in Dallas, Texas, he says, if God's word is not working, you need to check the ground it landed on because there is nothing wrong with the seed. You see, there's nothing wrong with the word of God. The word of God is the truth. The word of God is perfect. The word of God is alive. It's living. It's active. It's able to do heart surgery in our lives. But if the word of God's not working, it's not the word of God's fault. There's something wrong with the, the soil in our hearts. Now, there is a danger of being complacent. A person might be producing maybe 10-fold, maybe 20, maybe 30, maybe even 40 or 50-fold of fruit, and that's good. But there is a danger in complacency. There's a danger in, in just being content at the current level of Christian character and Christian service that you are currently at. You could say, well, I'm doing good. At least I'm in church because I know several other people. They're Christians, but they're not really walking with the Lord. I'm better than them. And you can say, I'm just going to put it in cruise control because at least I'm doing better than them. Hey, I'm producing 30-fold. It's better than a lot of them. Better than all those rocky soil people. Better than all those, those thorn-infested sin soil people. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Put it in neutral. When a person is complacent, they're content. Hey, I'm doing okay. That is a recipe for disaster. There's no better example to see what happens to a person who is complacent in their walk with Jesus than King David. Remember King David? This guy had so much faith that he took a little rock and put it in his sling and he killed Goliath. This guy had so much faith that he kept on walking with the Lord, even though Saul was chasing him. He was a fugitive. He could have died several times. This guy had so much faith that the Bible tells us that this is a man after God's own heart. This guy loved God so much. This guy worshiped God so much that he wrote so many of the Psalms that comfort us and, and, and put, point us to Jesus. But David became complacent. He became content. He allowed his past victories to say, hey, I've done enough. I don't have to serve God anymore. I don't have to grow in my walk with the Lord. I don't have to worship anymore. I don't have to fight the spiritual fight. And you know what he did? He said, okay, my generals, my military, my soldiers, you go fight. I'm going to stay here in the palace. I'm comfortable. And you know what happened? Everybody's out there fighting. And David starts looking around. He starts lusting after Bathsheba. He commits adultery with her. And he then murders her husband, Uriah. You might say, well, that would never happen to me. Well, wait a minute. 
Think about this. Here's David. He's a man after God's own heart, written many of the Psalms, slain Goliath, done all these wonderful, amazing things, and he fell. If we have that attitude, well, that would never happen to me. The devil has you exactly where he wants you. If you think I can never fall in, in sin, I, oh yeah, I might commit a little tiny sin. No, if, but if you think I can never fall into sin like David did, the devil has you exactly where he wants you. He's laughing right now. He's overjoyed at a complacent, content Christian. Because the Bible says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So sow to the Spirit. Keep reading the Word of God, applying the Word of God, worshiping God, saying no to sin. Two weeks ago, we had our men's meeting. Yesterday, the ladies got together for the women's meeting. We've got our prayer meeting every Wednesday. I hope you guys can join us on Zoom, our meeting, right after this service. And I want you guys, and I thank you guys for serving the Lord, serving the Lord where you're at, in your families, wherever you're at. And thank you guys for serving here at church. And I want to thank all the men and women who've been helping to paint next door at this, in, in the sanctuary. But I also need some other service. I need help directing traffic for next week in our parking lots. I need help setting up the sound. I need help uh, setting up the tent. Let me know. And I want to encourage you guys, make the best of the situation that God has sovereignly allowed you to be in. Is it ideal? Well, on a worldly standpoint, it's not ideal. But you make the best of the situation with the hand that you've been dealt and you watch God work. You watch God work. You, just like Moses, he's trapped in. There's a mountain on this side. There's a mountain on that side. The Red Sea's in front of him and Pharaoh and the armies are behind him. And he says, what do I got? I don't have anything. And he takes his staff and he says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You make the best of the situation that God has, has placed you in and you watch him part Red Seas and you watch him, um, you watch him use you to share the gospel. You watch him to write encouraging letters. You watch him do things that are beyond what you could have ever expected. And I want to encourage you and I thank you. And I'm proud of you. You're listening right now. You're watching right now. You keep it up. Don't let the devil rip you off. What type of soil is in your heart? And you know what? Our, the type of soil in our hearts, they can change right now. You have the ability to select the soil type of your heart. What will it be? Will it be the rocky soil, the shallow faith, or will it be the soil that's crowded with the world and with sin, thorns choking us up, or will it be that good soil? that the Lord wants to produce 30, 60, or 100 fold. Lord, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the word of God, that it's powerful and that it's living, and it's able to penetrate our hearts and produce fruit so that people could look at our lives and say, wow, the Lord has done great things in them and through them. Lord, to you be the glory. We ask you, God, for your blessings to be upon all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.